But I figured we'd just use the old King James tonight. Yep, mm -hmm. sounds good. All right. And uh, did you watch the last video? I haven't got a chance to watch it yet. Yeah. I liked the discussion we had on Genesis 9. I was happy with how that turned out. But then toward the end of it, I don't know. I thought our discussion of the tower could have gone better. And, uh, but I did put a couple segments in that'll, it was enough to get people thinking. But, um, I just realized a few things I could say better. So I figured we'd go back over the tower a little. And there's so much to get into. And really, something I should bring out is the theme of covenant because there's something important I need to cover before we really get into the tower. All right. And what it is, is um, in Genesis 6, God tells Noah to make this ark. And uh, in verse 17 and 18, he says, And behold, I, even I, to bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So this is the first time the mention of God's covenant comes up in 618. And in chapter 8, Noah builds an altar. What will come up is this idea that God's going to make a covenant, and it pertains to restoring the Axis Mundi. Um, once the flood occurs and the garden is destroyed, then God makes a covenant with Noah in chapter 9. And also, once the garden's destroyed in the flood and Noah comes off the ark, he builds an altar. And this is the first time the word is used. We can infer from Genesis 4 that Cain and Abel were utilizing an altar, but the word isn't used. But after the garden's destroyed, the word is used, and this theme of altar will develop as the scriptural narrative goes on, and this theme of God making covenants pertaining to restoring this original temple, this Axis Mundi. Here's a page out of Daniel Block's book, The Gods of the Nations. And what God sets up with the Edenic people in Genesis 8 and 9, he's establishing this relationship. He's God over the Edenic clan, and the covenant pertains to the land of Eden. And this is really the first, the first national identity, so to speak. And this structure, this relationship here is important to understand because the ancient Canaanite people had this same structure in their national identities. It's, it's set up this way in chapter 9 of Genesis. God with the Edenic people in the land. And so that's the only type of relationship like that that exists on the earth at this time from chapter 9 through to 
the tower incident, okay? And so it's just kind of important to understand that. And the idea of God making his covenant to restore Eden and so forth, that's all just some important stuff that I didn't talk about when we talked last time before getting into the tower. I like this diagram, particularly because it focuses on the land. I think a, a lot of people, and I've heard some pastors preach how like Israel was trying to reestablish connection with re reconnect with God by, you know, following the 10 commandments and li uh, living according to righteousness. But I think it'd be easily forgotten that really this land is really important to keep in mind that that's really was the ultimate goal uh, of a lot of the um, Edenic people. And then Israel was to get this land, to establish this land um, that was right. necessary for them. Right. It all connects back to the Edenic narrative. Israel's history, like you can see what's going on and why it's going on. Okay. I guess I could move on from there. Is that, yeah, okay. Is that good? Is that help? Not, yeah, that sounds good, man. I was just going to add that, and then we'll come to find out in the Tower of Babel narrative that, uh, excuse me, this land portion wasn't right. They didn't build in the right land, correct? Yeah. yeah. So they, I don't know if you would say they violated the van, the, the, the land concept of this diagram, or they just uh, didn't quite get it um, to, to reach, to kind of meet this triangle to have deity people and land. They kind of messed up the land. So they, they really messed up the uh, connection here then. Right. Thus led to God intervening. Right. Right. Yeah. They violated this. And what I was trying to say to you last time, and it just didn't come across well. These are my, this is my understanding of the Bible, and I don't go around teaching this to people. So I don't know. If you listen to enough of the videos, you can tell. It's kind of my first time trying to communicate this to other people, you know, so it just doesn't come across right a lot of times. And so maybe this time it'll make a little more sense. I could tell when I was explaining it to you last time, though, that I was like, do you see that? And you were like, yeah. And I could tell like, eh, it didn't connect too well. <laughs> It, and, it's a lot of new stuff for me too. Let you know, let alone you discovering it as well. So I can imagine. Yeah. Well. Okay. The the thing about the tower narrative here, the tower pericope, as people call it, scholars call it, I guess. Um. A sort of juvenile exposition is taken for granted and it's just read this way and what it is is people they're reading genesis they just have this thing oh this is the first one of this and this is the first time for that and they just read that in there everywhere they're looking in genesis kind of like that that's the first rainbow you know and that just happens a lot. People just do that. They've been encouraged to read it that way. And everyone just does that. And it's totally improper. And so when you're reading this, this isn't just the only people on earth right now. But that's how it's read. So they'll say, and the, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So just all the people speak the same language all the people of the earth and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar oh so they came to this plan and named it Shinar I guess and they dwelt there 
And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick. They invented brick. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Well, they invented the ziggurat or something. That's how people will read it. And it's totally wrong. And what you see here really in the opening statement and the whole land was of one language. This is the unity of the people in the sacred region, in Eretz Eden. And as it goes on to say, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, I'm reading the King James here, they is, as we talked about in the last discussion in Genesis 9, you can tell who it is. It's him and his descendants that are trying to get away from the consequences of Noah's curse. They've been instructed by God to fill the land, okay, in Genesis 9-1. All of them coming down off the ark, they were instructed to fill the land. and But Noah put a curse on Canaan and his descendants and you can tell the birthright is coming through that line, but Noah cursed it in the land. And so they left, and they came, they journeyed, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now, actually, the narrator here is referring to a land that already existed, the land of Shinar. And there were people there that existed. These things are already in place. And it goes on to say, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. What Moses is saying here, is that they were influenced by the people there to build a ziggurat because it was known that the people over there were engaging in this ziggurat building and what they were trying to achieve to call down the deity. And Moses is saying that they were encouraged into this by the people there. He's not saying these things were invented for the first time. And really, the giveaway is a plain in the land of Shinar. Now, why would they go there and name a place Shinar? So you have to see that these things exist, really. And something else is that um, when the garden existed and when when Cain was afraid of people outside. It's because there were people outside, okay? And there were these different people groups around. And I know that sounds strange to people, but that is the way it was. And I can prove it with the Tower narrative. These different names have meaning and this goes on up. I don't know how far it goes up, but a lot of these names are ascribed for a purpose to tell us about the person. And that's something you need to know as you read the Table of Nations and the 70 people are enumerated. Um, these are all people groups, and it's assumed that these men are the very progenitors of the groups, but they're not. They were absorbed into these groups. That's what actually happened at the tower, and that's what people don't know. So... I'm probably not presenting this very well once again, but we'll just go with it. Uh, 
I don't know. Does well, you it... said you you went. <clears throat> I was gonna say you, you. Well, you came here just to prove that that there were other people around, right? Yeah, the people that, that groups were. Yeah, the people groups we're familiar with at this later time. You know, you never would imagine that these peoples already existed around. A lot of people just never would imagine that, but that is the way it was. Well, they're they're not taught that, right? I mean, if 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 uh, everybody's killed after the ark, and it's just Noah, his wife, and then his three sons and wives. That's it. There's no. I mean, I suppose some some lands could have been established before the flood, but I like to think that everything was wiped off. Wipe at least from the young Earth global flood perspective, everything was wiped out. No land, and they had to start from scratch. So, I would say people would 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 naturally think that there was no other land, no other places established yet. Yeah, I guess I should be careful about how I describe it because the flood would have destroyed things. You know, but between that time and this later time of the Tower of Babel and stuff, people just lived in the area once again. Maybe once I get into the Tower narrative, then it'll become more clear. Maybe I'll explain this part of it again. Well, one thing you did mention real clearly, which I think was real cool that I've never seen is if you go to Genesis uh, 11, verse two, and you mentioned it, and it came to pass as they journeyed, technically journeyed east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. I've never thought about that, but when Moses shares this, it definitely sounds like this land of Shinar was already founded, was already commonly known, and they just moved there. They didn't find that land like it's it you're 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 right about that that's really interesting how maybe this plane in shinar they they visited for the first time but this land of shinar definitely sounds like it's already been established as a known nation a known land yeah it just sounds like it's known to them um i guess it could be argued that like the narrator is just stating it that way in accordance with the knowledge of his audience, so like for their sakes, like it's just the narrator telling the audience, you know. Um, so it, it it could be said maybe that I'm reading too much into it or something, but one thing is for sure: these people didn't journey east and decide like. Let's call this place Shinar, you know. Absolutely. Um, that's that's what I that's what I think is very clear. Yeah. And I think the narrator is just supposing that other peoples existed because I think it's taken for granted in the Cain narrative and elsewhere that Adam guarded the garden. And we've talked about some of that. So I think it's taken for granted again here that they journeyed east to have found a plain in the land of Shinar. Um, I think it's just assumed there again, as it is in other places. So I don't know. Am I reading too much into it? Eh, maybe. I don't know. It's up to the individual to decide. <laughs> <laughs> but they were influenced by people to do this thing they did. And Moses is trying to indicate to us that they built a ziggurat that is the, the type of structure here. And he needs to tell his audience that because he's bringing them out of Egypt and the ziggurat is a different sort of idea than the pyramid. And um, the ziggurat is a Mesopotamian 
concept, really. So Moses needed to tell them this, you know, that it was the ziggurat idea that was done. Um, okay. But here's the thing. This isn't a long period elapsing here. They don't just journey around and find a plane and dwell there for a while. And then, oh, they kind of invented brick after a while. And then one day they were like, well, let's make a tower. And so they did. It wasn't like that. What you have here is sort of a a a sweeping action because of Noah's curse in the land, they go to a different Eretz deliberately and attempt to reestablish the Axis Mundi on their terms in this new place, having the birthright. This is all really a, a, a single movement. It's a single sort of rebellion they're doing here. Well, rebellion, though, see, I shouldn't call it that because they uh, thought the Lord may approve of this and reestablish the Axis Mundi. So I don't know about calling I shouldn't call it a rebellion, I guess. And um, But they weren't doing it right. And going to the wrong Eretz is a problem. Yeah, when they go over there, though, they're violating this little thing here. Um, yeah, they're real hard bent on trying to to establish a name for themselves, so they're kind of maybe a little arrogant, I suppose. Uh, I don't know, rebellious, rebellious. I, yeah, I don't know, arrogant, maybe. I I don't know, but they definitely, at least, are selfish in that they think that they'll be able to do this. They can establish a name for themselves, but as you mentioned, they. They, they don't because they're in the wrong land. Yeah, it's a reaction to their situation. They're cursed in the Eretz. They have the birthright. They go to this different Eretz. But, like, look, they have this plan to reestablish the Axis Muni. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole Eretz. They have the sacred land in mind there. They are talking about Eden there. This thing they're doing, journeying to this different Eretz, building this tower, making a name for themselves, all of this was to avoid this being scattered abroad upon the face of the whole Eretz, Eden. And it was at this point here where... Uh, I was talking to my mom about this after we had our discussion. I was talking to her and she was like, that seems like a strange way to word that. And, but look at this lane. When you look at, uh, when you look at the table of nations, then look at Genesis 10, 15, I'll start reading it, Genesis 10, 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zimmerite, and the Hamathite. And afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad, that word, spread abroad, that's the same language used here in 11.4. Lest we be spread abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That language is used in Genesis 10 of the Canaanite people. Specifically. If you look at it with blue letter Bible, you'll see the connection. 1018 with 11.4. Scattered abroad, spread abroad. And it's interesting, I thought, that in the Table of Nations, that language is used of the Canaanite people. 
But that's their fear here in the tower narrative. You have that fear in their minds in verse 4. And that's the real context of the tower. Chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And at the end of the narrative, verse 9, from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. It's talking about that destiny that befell the Edenic people. And uh, we've talked about that. They're scattered abroad for the most part upon here. And Cain and I have in 18, but the Jebusite and these people right in here. And uh, so that is the real context of the tower story the Canaanite people were scattered abroad in the Arids the other people were pushed outside the Arids Eber and his descendants were pushed to the other side of the Euphrates Japheth and his sons were pushed outside outside the land and the birthright followed Primarily Canaan and his descendants here. And then Ham and his descendants, Egypt and elsewhere. But that's the real tower context. Is that cool, man? Does that make sense? Yeah, man, for sure. All right. Yeah, I think that came together pretty good. You know, I I know that a lot of this stuff is kind of new, can be kind of difficult to kind of explain it logically, but uh all the pieces are there at the very least, let alone I think uh I think they got the idea for sure. Well in the next meeting we'll have to discuss Babel, what it means, and why this pattern that existed with God and Eden is shattered apart. All three of these are shattered apart in their own kind of way. Chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. I gotta stop and say something. So whenever Eretz is used, it's Eden. And you have to stick with that pattern all the way through even the Tower story. So from at least uh, Genesis 2, 4, from there on through eleven nine, the tower narrative, you have to maintain that meaning for Eretz. When it's used alone like this, it's talking about Eden. When it has a qualifier on it like this, it's talking about a different Eretz. Always. So you follow that pattern. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, 
and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So you got to stick with the Eretz pattern here too. And so what they're doing here is they're trying to establish the name lest they be scattered or spread abroad upon the face of the whole sacred land. That's what they're looking to avoid. And that is something that people, they'll disagree with me at first. Like the, some people watching this, they'll disagree at first. But think on it, folks, and stick with the context and think about it. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Okay. Now you notice that... Okay. How should I put this? The narrator is pointing out that that Yahweh makes the observation himself before he calls on the council. And so this is not something that was discussed and then God acted, which is another way that God acts in certain times. And I kind of referred to how I see this in Genesis 6 a bit in the pre-Adamite chat, Voices of Heaven. It was interesting. I was reading First Enoch, and there's a real clear uh, depiction of this heavenly discussion before the flood. And I was like, wow, that's a just a real clear example of it there in First Enoch. But... Anyway, here, this is a different kind of action. This is God. Well, it's like I said. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Okay, let us. This comes up three times in this opening section of Genesis. Genesis 1 to 11. And I could make a whole video on that, really, but it plays into what I call the education of the angels. And the first time is in Genesis 1, creating mankind, the image of God. And then it comes up in the priest, the failure of the priest, the transgression of the priest, and his being expelled from the temple. So mankind is left without an appropriate priest. And the education of the angels is involved there. And here, the education of the angels is involved in the fact that mankind doesn't have an appropriate king. That's the idea. And the reason I say that is because when Noah and family came off the ark and God formed this relationship with the people in the land and he made a covenant and what happened when Ham did what he did to Noah it was a way of uh, 
usurping his authority. And we discussed that back in the older videos on that. And uh, I go to the Talmud to show some of these thoughts, and then I get my own thoughts on it. But what you have involved there is something similar to what Absalom did to King David. And so when this line of the Edenic clan went and performed this act, it was a transgression and really a failure in his role as leader. And kingship or nations is the theme that will come out here. And so it's just a pattern to pick up on in Genesis. You have like a priest and king. We're lacking the appropriate priest and king following these failures, all right? And then the education of the angels is involved in all of that, which is why once you understand the tower and what it means, and then the curtains close, right? As in, as if you're watching a play. A few moments pass, and when the curtains part, you find a world where there's a lot of different nations. They all have their region, and they all have their God. This is the world Abraham finds himself in, and it's a result of the tower. All these different peoples with their regions and their gods. It's a result of the tower. This relationship that existed with Eden is fractured after the tower, and it's shared by all the nations. They all have this relationship, and it's because of the tower. But what it is, is um, God delegated to the divine council this role as the deity of the nation and it, all the different peoples, all the different lands. That is why, though, this comes up for the third time at this point. Let us go down. And the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the Arids. He, this is talking about the people involved here in, in the episode. You know, there's a Dinic people that are still in Eden. Shem and Japheth and their families are still there. And... The narrative focuses on the Hamitic line who has the birthright and is involved in the incident. The, the narrative is really focused on them. But some people could say, well, it was the whole clan punished though? And you can tell that it was by the Table of Nations. And you see this, a pattern where Ham and his descendants are essentially in Canaan, and the others are pushed outside. And Abraham comes from, he's pushed to the east. He's a descendant of Eber, who's on the other side of the Euphrates. So he's in the east, and a narrative sort of begins where he will start traveling west. That kind of issues involved, but it's like Cain when he left 
because of the curse. He secured his place as the one. He would be the one, hopefully, right? He killed his brother, so he was hoping to secure his place there, but he got cursed in the Eretz. He left, and he went east. And uh, part of the reason I insist on uh, the translation that as they journeyed eastward is because I think it follows this pattern. I think they left and went east. And then when God calls out Abraham, he starts to bring him in the western direction into Canaan. So there's just patterns there that mm -hmm. I think I think they mean something. Something that people think is that uh, that they actually built this tower. And you'll see people drawing pictures of it, paintings of it, like on a Google image search, Tower of Babel. And they have a huge tower built. Even the picture I use is over the top, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I I love it. It's a great painting, but it's just ridiculous. And uh, no such thing occurred, you know. Um, this was an interrupted project, you know. Um, I do think, though, that they began building it. And uh, really, um, okay, so I, ex I explained a bit why this appears again. And um, okay. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Now, this is the key to understanding the things I've said. Because, because the, the misreading of, of this, when people misread this, this little story here, verses 1 to 9, the pericope, yeah, people have a fanciful reading, and they get down this far. And so they think, so the people were scattered around. And if you use a table of nations, you see basically that those families became all the different people of the earth. And I suppose you can read it that way. But you end up with a lot of problems. Um, they think the origin of languages is here. Conf mm -hmm. Confound their language. Um, origin of languages. Origin of all the different people. Some will speculate that races suddenly appeared. At, yeah, at this every point. Yeah, a lot, lot of young Earth creationists, and I think, and even if someone doesn't hold that idea closely, but I suppose most traditional Christians definitely every all diversification, language, race, geography occurred at the Tower of Babel. That's that's pretty commonly accepted from a traditional Christian perspective, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's just an impossible meaning for a lot of reasons. Um, so what's really going on, though, is that the Edenic clan is being dissolved into all the other people groups around. And... You can tell this, therefore, is the name of it called Babel.
from the root, meaning mixed, mingled, confound, anointed, mixed, But it's a word that means what it what it means is if if you had a container with I don't know some certain liquid in it, and then you had another container and you poured the one into the other and they mixed together. Mm. That's that's the idea that this word pertains to. And so what happened to the Edenic people? It says their language was confounded. What it is, is they were, their language was immediately mixed with other people groups, all these other people groups. It was confused. People will say like, their languages were confused. It would have been confusing, but they were changed. It was like a curse that happened instantly. And you can tell that from, uh, <clears throat> I'm running out of time, it says. You can tell that from the narrative you can tell from the way the narrative goes that uh, this is like an, an instant sort of curse. And I imagine that uh, for a moment, they just couldn't communicate. But then they were displaced. They were... They were scattered. And the project wasn't finished at all, I don't think. I I think it was beginning, but it, it wasn't underway. I I'll talk about but you know, how did what did this look like? I don't know, it's hard to tell. Um was it as supernatural as a harpazo, like um, Philip after he baptized the Ethiopian, he was caught away and then found himself in another location. Uh, was it a supernatural sort of cursed event like that? It could have been. The word they were separated is the same as the word used of the supernatural waters of Eden. The river went out of Eden, and from thence it was parted or separated. It's, this word is used again. And... Uh, Two, four heads, four tops, that I think is four headwaters of rivers that represent the, the earth, the earth being blessed by this axis mundi, the whole known earth. And I think the same kind of thing is occurring here. Like there was a, a supernatural scattering in a similar kind of way of these people it sounds crazy mm -hmm. but uh they were mixed with these people and so you have to see that there were already people on the earth and there were already different languages and this Edenic clan was dissolved into all the other people. But it's the first time 
in God's eyes on earth that those people would be recognized as nations with their territories. And God assigned divine council members over these regions as their gods. And that's something that I would have to develop in another video. That's a big idea. And uh, that's something that Dr. Heiser talks about a lot, these gods of the nations. But like I said, when when the curtains part and Abraham's in the world, what do we find? All these different nations with their gods. And that's why. That's why it's like that. And all these different gods were known as Baals. Baal. And you can find that in places like Numbers 23. You find real interesting stuff right around in there. 22, 23, 24. You find Balaam, who we'll have to talk about. Man, Lane, I have a whole bunch of stuff I got to talk to you about. And, uh, but the bales and stuff. Uh, Just going to have to meet next week then, I suppose. Yeah. This is good enough, though. This is good. This is a full tower context. People have the full context. And we'll have to get into the gods and the nations more. And the priests of the nations. That's something I got to get into. And, uh, and I should also talk about Balaam a little bit because... He's a curious guy. And uh, Moses' father-in-law, it's real important, this mountain of God where Moses takes the sheep for grazing. Got to talk about that. <laughs> I have tons of good stuff to talk to you about, man. It'll all play. It'll all connect to sacred mountain themes. And... Uh, I can explain something from the New Testament that will blow some people away. So we'll get Sounds into good. all that. That sounds good to me, man. <laughs> <laughs>